so good that I can't see you, or I would be so nervous after that introduction. <laughs> My goodness gracious. So what I wanted to start with is something that we all know. Language is power. It gives us power. And some of us, they tell me, have the gift of gab. For others, words fly trippingly off the tongue. I guess that's if you're Irish. And for others, we are known as silver-tongued devils. Although sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me, sounds good, it isn't always true. It isn't always so. And as teachers, we are devoted, deeply devoted to the enrichment of the minds of young people. And what I want to do with you today is look at the power of language for all we do when we interact with these little people who are our future. So you will see that the very, very intelligent Dr. Michael Halliday was oh so very right when he said, language is the essential condition of knowing, the process by which experience becomes knowledge. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to think about this for a long moment, not a long minute, it's too much for me to say, but a long moment, because it is what you are experiencing right now. Language, the essential condition of knowing, is the process by which this experience will become knowledge for you. That's what we need to do in the language that we use for the children. So as we take a look at this slide, some of you have seen this before, it really makes the point that language and cognition, and for our purposes today, cognition will be knowing and meaning and understanding. Language is a crucial, crucial part of cognition, how we know and mean and understand. And when I say language, I don't mean French or German or Italian or Hindi or Farsi, but I mean the sounds in any language that get made into words and the words that get turned into sentences to communicate a varying array of meanings to a variety of people for any number of different purposes in different circumstances. The purpose of language is for communication, and it influences our thinking, our feelings, and our sense of being. In addition to which, it is the foundation of all literacy skills. That we know absolutely to be true. But you've got to develop your oral language skills before you start teaching literacy skills. So what we all wish for is the gift of love, of a good life, good health, happiness, contentment, all such wonderful gifts for which we are enormously grateful. But there's one gift for which I am grateful as well, and I bet you are too. Once when I made this comment to a large group of people, somebody called out sex. Um, no, 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 I'm a language therapist, not Dr. Ruth or Dr. Phil. Um, what I mean is the gift of language and the human contact that comes from being able to communicate. Take a look at this. All right. Just think of all the things that we can do with language. Answer, argue, announce, babble, beg, brag, how am I doing? Call, complain, confess, you can add, declare, deny, deny delight, explain, explore, extol. There's a 50 cent word for you, extol. Now that's 15 different things you can do with language and I am only up to the E's in our alphabet. The list goes on and on. How many of you remember that old gem, The King and I? Ah, there are old people in the audience, okay. So you know what The King and I said other than shall we dance? He said, tis a wonderment. And that's how I feel about language, it's a wonderment. It's flexible, it's supple, it's resilient, it's ever-changing, yet it is so predictable and in some ways it is the same and it is a gift, an enormous gift that we can give to children. And it's a gift that keeps on giving to children because talking and listening become literate language, decoding and comprehension, spelling and writing. 
but by the same token, we want to look at each and every child as an individual, as well as a person in the context of a group. And just as Dr. McNamee said so eloquently this morning, we ask this question, who is this child? And in order to answer that question, what we have to look at is that youngster's inherent neurology, his or her personality style, not everybody is as sparkling and delightful as I am on a Friday afternoon. Um, what we're trying, what? Um, do you think it's easy to follow Joanne Deke? Do you think it is easy to follow Joanne Deke? All right. We're trying to have an integrated, not fragmented view of the child and recognize that at all times, all of these factors, his neurology, his personality, personality, his cognition and language, and how he feels in his clothes and his sensory motor skills and his executive functions, the way he organizes the mental functions of his mind, his memory, his emotional being, and how he's gonna be a little ac academician. This is not about segregation of abilities. It's about an integration and an interdependence of abilities. So now, because I'm a language lover, get ready. I am going to synonymize you. You know that word? I'm going to synonymize you into appreciating all that I am trying to say. So here comes the big heads up. Get ready. Prepare yourselves. Alert. Focus. Because, because, I've been trying to write a book for a very, very long time. And now with the assistance of, through the kindness of, via my affiliation with, as a result of my connections at the 92nd Street Y, I have finally begun the process. So here's the title of the book. Don't steal this title. <laughs> Hello, there it is. The title is Talking Isn't Teaching. All right. And moreover, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that just because you taught it doesn't mean they learned it. That's something we must all keep in mind. So I wanted to start with a couple of stories. You see those kids playing with blocks up there in the upper, yeah, that side corner? I only have a, a left brain, not a right brain. And so I want to start with these two stories. I met a woman last week when I was offering a course up in Westchester County. And she told me this extraordinary story, a true story. She was uh, in a supervisory capacity in, um, kin for kindergartens in a school district here in New York City. And one day, an administrator above her came to her and said, I want you to remove all the blocks and toys from all the kindergartens. Remove the blocks and toys from the kindergartens because we're going to have a great focus on literacy and we're bringing in a lot of books and uh, literacy materials, so I want you to get rid of them. So what she explained to me was that she took them all from all of the kindergartens and then she quit and went to work in a nursery school in Westchester County where they have the most enormous collection of blocks in all of Westchester, possibly Rockland and Fairfield County. So now she's got a play-based nursery school. And then, and please note, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but you see those chubby little legs on that baby? I love those chubby little legs. They're so pinchable. And I don't know if you noticed, but the baby's reading a book. And it is indeed upside down, because that's the second part of the story. A parent came to this woman who left her position in the city and became a nursery school director and said, we love your preschool, but it isn't academic enough for that kid reading the book upside down. <laughs> right. Now, why do I tell you these stories? Because the research is very, very, very clear. Yes, I talk about language, but there's, there's language in mathematics as well. So for those of you who may have this issue, you may go back to your schools, back to your administrators, and tell them that studies were recently published out of Temple and uh, University of Delaware, Temple University and University of Delaware, that playing with blocks Playing with blocks, building with blocks, helps preschoolers develop the kinds of skills that develop and support later learning in science, in technology, 
and in engineering as well as mathematics, the STEM subjects. Further, for those children in inner city who are of lower socioeconomic class, who lag behind in spatial skills, playing with blocks may be particularly important. Can you imagine that they studied more than 100 three-year-olds of varying socioeconomic class, and they found, you ready? Three-year-olds who were better at copying block structures were also better at early math. And among the skills that they tested in these children were to see if they could figure out which block belongs above and which block belongs below another block when aligning the pieces. And they found that by the age of three, three, they're still in pampers at three, children of lower socioeconomic background were already falling behind their peers in spatial skills. All right. That means that because they have more limited experience of blocks and other toys and materials that facilitate the development of mathematical thinking, the language, for instance, that goes along with it, for example, above and below, not only did these children, as a rule, have less awareness of these words, in interviews with parents, these words were not part of the family's repertoire. Do you know how cheap blocks are? Do you know how easy they are to clean? So we want the kinds of toys in our classrooms that not only will build mathematical skills, but will also build language skills for them. These kids were learning to add and subtract. And now, here's what you can say to the parents about this block play. The research in the science of learning, you may tell them, has shown that the experiences of block building and puzzle play, are you ready? Improve children's spatial skills and support complex mathematical problem solving in middle school and high school. So building with blocks in your pampers with your fat little thighs <laughs> is likely to get you at least a B in math in middle school as opposed to sitting and um, memorizing information. All right. So I want to stress how early on, early on, we need to be playing purposefully and to understand play and the language of play in a different, different way. All righty. So what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of of this afternoon is that the purpose of language is from communication and that we are, um, the language that teachers use has enormous, enormous influence on each of these areas of children's play, all right? There is no question about it. So I'm going to address each and every one of this. Language and the communicative impact are influential in children's play intellectual development, pre-literacy foundations, and in their social emotional development. How many of you play tennis, golf, mahjong? Come on. How many of you play words with friends? That doesn't count, all right? I'm going to get divorced over words with friends is what's about to happen. So if anybody is, never mind. OK, I was just backing up. We know that play for children is not the same as play is for us. We play tennis. We play golf. We play words with friends. We play racquetball. We play all sorts of things. For us, it's an escape. It's leisure time activity. But that's not true for little kids. You can read that. It's thinking time. It's language time. It's problem solving time. It's memory and planning and figuring out and investigating time. It's the time when we organize all of our ideas, when you use all of you, that integrated picture. Who is this child in play with toys, with objects, with others? And how does he come to be more of himself? According to Vygotsky, we heard all about Vygotsky this morning, thought and language are intimately related. And play is the bridge, 
It is the bridge, the George Washington, the Verrazano, and what do they call the 59th Street Bridge now, the Ed Koch? All right. I'm still struggling with the Triborough. Three boroughs, Bronx, never mind. Triborough, it is the bridge. Play is the bridge between an action-oriented view of the world I'm doing and a thought-oriented view of the world. I am thinking about what I'm going to do, what I'm doing, what I will do. Playfulness. Playfulness. Think of the different levels at which you use that word. I was being playful with my respected colleague, Dr. Deke, when I whistled at her before. But that's not the same playfulness in which children engage. Playfulness allows you to develop a sense, I can do it. I can. I'm able to. It allows you to develop a sense of physical spontaneity, of social spontaneity. I play with you, I play with you, I play with you. It allows you to develop a sense of cognitive spontaneity. I can think of something new. I listen to Dr. McNamee and all the stories of the children's creativity. I can think of, generate something new when I am playing. And you know what? Play is fun. And you can be funny and demonstrate a sense of humor as well when you're playing. What do children talk about? Some of you, I can't see any of you, but some of you remember that I have two children, a set of 23-year-old twins. And they, if they knew I did this, it would be all over for me. But um, I like to tell this story because the boys were about four when this happened. And Joshua came to me very distressed. Mommy, he said, Russell never leaves me alone. Oh, I said, why is that a problem? And he said, because I need time to think. <laughs> and I said, oh, what is it that you need to think about? I need to think about when I'm going to play. He was thinking about what he was going to play. So play creates an opportunity for us to create and imagine and be original. And there's this guy talking about it. It teaches us to maintain our focus. It teaches us to have stick to -itiveness. It teaches us to enjoy. Play is important because it also teaches you how to be a part of a group. And it teaches you, it teaches you how to communicate and negotiate your needs and your wants. So now I want you to get ready for this next slide because here comes an example of the power of language, how you can reframe thinking with words because these days play is not seen as a positive thing. And I think play is essential, as does everybody who's been here today, to the development of social emotional skills and language skills. So you may use this going forward. In our nursery school, dear agitated, aggressive, excited, worried parent, the children do not play. They are, in fact, engaged in self-initiated cognitive activity. Take that back to your schools. <laughs> but it's true, but it's true. So let's take a look at some basic principles of play and of language. We know that when um, children are playing, they produce their most elaborate play. Uh, when children are playing, they produce their most elaborate language. All right, we know that to be true from the research. And to encourage, among our little friends, adults need to do some of these things. They need to be interactive with the kids, follow their lead sometimes, and sometimes initiate. But here's what I want you to be most attuned to. What I want you to do is use the language, your language, at the current level of the child. I don't care how old he or she is, but use language at his or her developmental level. That's enormously important. Talk to him where he is. Meet her 
where she is, and then create a sandwich. Say it at that level, the youngster's level. Say it at a slightly higher level to provide a good model. Say it again at the level at which the child is functioning. Modeling and practice. Playing is supposed to be fun. You can't do it wrong. And if I'm talking to you about what you're playing at the level at which you are playing, I am helping you attach words to the thoughts that are being realized through your play. Be Vygotskyan in that regard. And remember this sandwich technique. Oh, big blocks. So many big blocks. Big blocks is the sandwich that provides them both with the model and then the practice. What we know then is that what children talk about is what they play. But we also know that language is enormously important in intellectual development. So between the ages of three and five, tiny little ones, they have enormous, enormous growth in language and they begin to have more and more and more and more words to represent categories and different concepts, different um, uh, approaches to reasoning and, and problem solving. But even more than that, they develop memories based on language. To wit, many, many years ago, and this is related to what Dr. Deek said about music and the emotional connection. Many, many years ago, my college roommate brought her daughter to New York City to visit me. They live in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And Rachel was at that time about 16 months old. We went to the Bronx Zoo and a chimpanzee had escaped. And, oh yes, it was a lovely sight. The police had the area cordoned off. And what I remember more than anything else was the two zookeepers, one with a giant net and the other with an enormous bunch of bananas on a pole. <laughs> so they were trying to fool, sucker, and trap, and snare this poor, terribly frightened chimpanzee. And they would wiggle you know, the bananas and he'd reach for them and then the guy would come running and try and net him. But the, the chimp was smarter than he was. And so this went on for a while. And this is a big deal because first of all, they are wild animals and you don't want a chimpanzee making way up Mashalu Parkway in the Bronx. <laughs> Nor do you want him injured. They're valuable. In any event, we watched this scene and then it began to rain. So we went back to my apartment. And though my friend was very much into eating in a healthy way, I went to the bakery, because this was a big celebration for them to come to New York, and I bought those gigantic uh, black and white cookies that are so popular here in New York. Now, I have it on good authority from um, Sara Lee herself that if you eat a Sara Lee cake from the freezer standing up with no utensils, it has no calories. <laughs> So I knew that if we ate this chocolate cookie without cutting it into pieces, without using a napkin, standing up, it wasn't going to do such harm. And so in any event, we had these wonderful, wonderful cookies. So the, the, the back part of the story happens then um, many months later when Rachel is three and I go to Scranton for her birthday. And what happens was this. All the ladies were yakety yakety yakking, and Rachel came up to me and tugged on me and said, Aunt Lyd, do you want to come up in my room and snuggle in my big girl bed? Drop those ladies in the glass of Sauvignon Blanc like a hot coal, and went up <laughs> to snuggle with Rachel. And she reminisced about the day in the park. And here comes the point about memories, positive and negative. Rachel was talking in single words, at 16 months, she had a couple of, uh, she had quite a number of words, but not too many phrases. And she said to me, Aunt Lyd, or as she used to say it, Aunt Wid, do you remember when the monkey escaped from the zoo and the man was chasing him with the bananas? And I did. And we related um, the events of that day. And then I said, and you know what else I remember, Rach? I remember that we had big black and white cookies, you know, chocolate and vanilla icing, and the kid looks me right in the eye and says, no, we didn't, because cookies is junk, Aunt Lyd. <laughs> OK, 
okay, what am I going to do? Tell the kid that she's got false memories? I'm not going to do that. But you see, memories developed based on language. So I said to her mother later in the day, were you and Rachel recently talking about that experience that we had in the Bronx Zoo when the chimpanzee escaped? And she smiled at me and she said, oh no, I haven't thought of that since it happened. Now Rachel had acquired the language to represent her experience, but I said to her, but sweets are still junk in your house. Absolutely, Lydia, they're not good for you, they're not good for your weight, they're not good for your teeth, they're not good for their neurology. No, Aunt Lyd, cookies is junk. And I'm telling you, the kid ate the whole cookie. <laughs> now, the point there is you develop memories based on the language to which you have been exposed. Moreover, moreover, you can learn to control your behavior and your emotion effectively, which is very, very crucial to the development of executive functions. Vygotsky talked about the role of speech and language in developing regulatory behavior in children. What we know is that children construct their understanding of any concept in the course of interaction with others, otherwise known as cookies is junk. All right. Not in my house, but in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Here are some things that you can do, take back to your classrooms, and I thought that they would be very practical, concrete, and meaningful to you. What can you do as a teacher? How do you practically realize some of the ideas about which I am speaking? One is a pattern called parallel talk, which is what I will do sometimes when I am presenting with a colleague. We will do model lessons in schools and then periodically stop and I do a sidebar about what is going on, why this behavior is important in teaching. So in parallel talk, what you are doing for the youngster is basically a little bit of a description of what the child is doing. You are attaching words to the experience. You're not supposed to be talking nonstop, but you have to know that your commentary of this kind, especially with the littlest ones, I'm in a two-year-old nursery uh, now. Uh, for those of you who work with two-year-olds, you will um, understand what I say when I tell the rest of you that I have discovered a multitude of shades of green that can emanate from the tiniest noses. Uh, I didn't know that it was possible. And you can't tell a two-year-old to cover your mouth, uh, cover your nose. So I've been working in the twos and doing a lot of this parallel talk to show the teachers how to talk in a meaningful way, not at the children. So parallel talk is sort of a sidebar, a little bit of a commentary. Descriptions are important because they are labeling or explaining and that enhances vocabulary. You're building important adjectives, important concept words for the children, and I know that this is what parents are pushing about, but the reality is that this behavior is highly important for later reading comprehension because one of the crucial skills or knowledge bases, rather, that um, reading comprehension is based upon is vocabulary. The more words you know, the easier it becomes for you to decode, to learn to decode. And if you can decode, say the sounds that, represent, that are represented by squiggles, but don't know the meaning of the words, you're really not reading. So early on, we're building in the language in the form of vocabulary, words, 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 by labeling and explaining. And this is you just sitting by and playing, all righty. This pattern of self-talk is something that I do with the children all the time. I talk about what I'm doing, why, why? Not simply because I adore the sound of my own voice, but it's because I want to represent to them how words and my thoughts and my actions go together. You do not see the immediate product herein. You are engaging in a process. When you saw that image of form and content and use, 
you didn't see expressive, receptive language, as I know you hear that reference all the time. Language is active, it's dynamic, it is a process, it is not simply a product. So this kind of self-talk is helping children recognize how words and thoughts and actions go together. And that is very important for them as young language learners. They know a lot more than they can say, a lot more than they can say. And then this notion of expanding. While I'm talking, please think about children with whom you are engaged in these practices. And if you're not, by all means, take them with you because, again, language is the ex essential condition of knowing the process by which experience becomes knowledge. So this expansion is important in building sentence structures, and that is also crucial in terms of reading comprehension and later in writing. So what are you doing now? You're taking the youngster's uh, utterance and you're revising it a little bit, you're putting a little spin on it, you're making the sentence structure a little bit more mature. That bear sitting, to which I say, that bear is sitting up because the power of my voice is enormous. I just hit is to provide that child. Can you imagine saying to a youngster, excuse me, sweetheart, you need an auxiliary verb in there? <laughs> well, you do, but you can't explain that to a youngster. I'm just curious, anybody in this audience have a parent who ever said, sweetheart, when you mean right now, put ing on the end of the verb to represent the present tense? <laughs> you did? I'll talk to you afterwards. There's help for that. Nobody's mother does that. Nobody's mother. You figure it out. The kids figure it out. But when I use this incredibly powerful tool called my voice, by hitting that word, that syllable that is a little harder, it registers. It creates a tiny piece of double stick Velcro on one of those rubber bands of Dr. Deeks waiting for more information about auxiliary verbs to be attached to it. So that bear sitting, oh, that bear is sitting up. I see him sitting. There's the expansion. And then this next part is important for all that preceded as well as the emotional and affective development in the child. You take that youngster's utterance and you expand it a little bit to something that is related but is about a feeling. That girl is eating. Oh, she must be really hungry. She wants to put food in her belly. Hungry feels echo. You expand on what the child is saying. And by the way, be careful not to talk too much. Just enough because it's too much information. You know that, TMI, right? Go ahead, ask me how I'm feeling and I'll tell you about my gallbladder. No, it's TMI, I don't wanna hear that. You wanna give them enough and then the time to process it. We are, the truth of the matter is you're old a lot longer than you're young. So we wanna give them, if you're lucky, we wanna give them the time to process. Take these home. Take these back to school. Here are a few more. Language expansions at higher levels. I wanted to be very pragmatic with you today. Rephrase and extend the child's words. That's a doggy, or as they are inclined to say, goggy. Yep, it's a cocker spaniel doggy. Yep, it's a great Dane doggy. Yep, it's a what? Shipu doggy. Shipu, that's Shih Tzu and Poodle, right, all right. So you want to, where I, where I come from, that was called a mutt, but not anymore. Um, but, but there's a piece of language, there's a piece of language, mutt. Mutt and Jeff, for those of you who remember. Oh, he's a real mutt, all right. You think of the different ways words have meanings. So you want to expand on the child's words. And then as was addressed this morning, you wanna ask a clarifying question. You heard that this morning about the good Mrs. Miller who learned to ask clarifying questions of the children. Tell me a little bit more. 
tell me about the man you saw. And that is called an open-ended question. And some children can't answer wide-opened questions. So you may have to narrow it to help build the staircase to the highest level. Tell me about the man. I don't know. You've seen that. I don't know. But what was the man wearing? Did he have a blue jacket or a green jacket? I went from wide open to what was he wearing to ch multiple choice, blue jacket or green jacket. You can engage in different levels of language interaction with the children to enable them to be communicative with you more effectively. In addition to which, you can model much more complex vocabulary or sentence structure. I had a very nice tidbit of feedback um, last night. I have taught in many nursery schools, with worked with faculty to teach them to use what my grandfather used to call 50 cent words, um, words that were not usual, not ordinary, not common. That was designed to keep me humble. Having been the first person in my family to have graduated from college, my grandfather would periodically say to me, so what is that, one of your 50 cent words? And so, but we've, we've done that in schools. Deliberately use a 50 cent word so that the children have to stop and say, and you teach them how, what does practical mean? Because you want to use that word, and if nobody asks, you wait a beat or two, and then say, did you all know what practical means? Did you all know what instantaneous means? Let's explore that word, okay? And so you want to build more complex vocabulary and more complex sentence structure. Add to it. I don't expect any youngster who is saying, see my building, Miss Liddy, to look at me the next week and say, do you see my complex skyscraper that I've built here? Many, many people can reside in my skyscraper. <laughs> That's not happening. That's my job, to offer that to him. Go back to the sandwich at his level, at a higher level, back at his level. Yes, I see your building. You built a tall skyscraper. Wow, it's got a lot of windows. Your building has a lot of windows back and forth, model and practice. And by all means, ask those open-ended questions. And if you don't get an answer to an open-ended question, by and large, an open-ended question means that you don't know what the answer is. You have to wait for the child to tell you what he knows. If the question is too broad for that little person, you have to say to yourself, who is this child? I have to change the level at which I'm approaching him or her, and then offer him a more closed-end question. Question, Not tell me about, or what was your favorite part, but did you like the part where? What part was scary? What part do you want to hear again? Did you like the part where he did this, ate all the cookies, or that, hid some of the cookies? That makes it more available to the youngster to grow. If we are constantly talking over their heads or at them or about them, it has a very different communicative value. All right. Because I like to eat, I like to focus upon snack time. Now, I learned a long time ago in the 80s never ever to eat anything that the children make. It happened, remember that reference to Shades of Green? I was new in the nursery school and we were making something. We washed our hands and we were all kneading and squeezing and mushing and pinching. You know, we were practicing vocabulary. And then somebody, hachoo! And I thought, okay, we're throwing that out. And the head teacher looked at me and said, 375 for 20 minutes, it'll be fine. <laughs> I bring my own snacks. I claim a gluten allergy. And so I learned that I, I like snack time. You know why? Because eating is so primal. And so it's a great time to start a conversation. Make comments. Don't ask a lot of questions. If you make comments, you get conversation. If you ask questions, 
you get answers. And that is different. That's a very different kind of language. It's a very different kind of interpersonal interaction, interpersonal intercourse. What you want is a discourse. Just all you have to remember is the 1970s and somebody who walked up to you on Third Avenue at the bar and said, so what's your sign? It's a conversation killer. And so don't ask questions, make comments. What can you talk about? You can talk about the snack, about its texture, about how you want to eat it in big bites or little bites, what it looks like in comparison, because what you are doing is attaching language to experience and broadening the horizons for the children, why you like certain foods, why you dislike others. All right, and funny ways to eat food. You want kids to talk with you, and you want to engage in funny kind of vocabulary. You can do, let's do three itty bitty teeny weeny bites. Let's do gerbil bites. Let's do bunny bites. Let's do kitty bites until it's all gone. You can do a whole math lesson in how to eat a granola bar. But that is the time that kids love to chit and chat. All right, about what they're eating and how they're eating it. So there it is. Conversation starters are, com are comments, observations, and self-questions. Gee, I wonder if there are fat raisins in there or they got squished, you know, squashed, mushed together when they were baked. Let's break it open and see. So now it's an experiment, and the language that you use creates opportunity, and nobody has to give you an answer to that. You open up and you explore. I guarantee you that if you ask questions about the obvious, you're going to get one-word answers, or you're going to get dead, dead, dead air. Okay, so I, I, this is my favorite one. I saw this, I saw this. This is what the little face looked like. It's four kids sitting at a table in a nursery school, which will remain unnamed. They are playing with blue Play-Doh, and an adult walks up to the children. They are playing with blue Play-Doh, the kind that you see under your nails later when you um, have gone out to dinner. And the teacher looks down and says to the kids, so is that blue? <laughs> and the, the little faces looked up at her like. <laughs> and, I, and I could just see going across their little foreheads. What are you, blind? <laughs> Why would you ask a question like that? You want to make comments. Blue's my favorite color, so I really like playing with blue Play-Doh more than red Play-Doh. I mean, it does the same thing, red Play-Doh and blue Play-Doh. That's me talking to four-year-olds, as opposed to, is that blue? So what I'm going to say very simply is, do not ask questions to which you already know the answer. Conversation stoppers. Think out loud. I wonder, what if, how can I figure this out? How can I figure out how to get three snakes, a mom and a dad and a baby, out of this little piece of Play-Doh? Hmm. And see what you get, which will be a lot more than blue. I promise. Comment in non-judgmental, observational ways about the process not only the product. So this guy has built this huge block construction because he's learning to do math. And what you might want to say in that instance is, wow, that big tower took a lot of planning and some real careful balancing. Because you've talked now about the process and given words to what he had to do to make this happen. All right, so we've talked about play, and we've talked about language in relation to play, and language in relation to intellectual development, in terms of thinking and problem solving and reasoning and how to expand. Let's talk about play in terms of pre-literacy development, 
pre-literacy development, okay? There's this thing called the push-down effect. I got uh, a lot of wonderful feedback when I was uh, very fortunate to have an invitation to present up at NYSACE for the NYSACE conference up at, at uh, Mohonk Mountain House where I talked about kindergarten being the new first grade which is very hard for a lot of children and very hard for uh, a, lot of, a lot of teachers. Uh, Pre-school uh, is not pre everywhere anymore. Uh, about four or five months ago, I was in a kindergarten class in another state observing a little boy and uh, the children had as the first activity of the day a 90-minute literacy block. They were five. They were five. My little guy is five, was actually seven, and was in kindergarten for the second time. But because of some developmental medical problems, he was not prepared for his grade level. And I watched these boys and girls circulate from sorting syllables and putting them together to a work page where they had to write out the words that they had put SN with OW and ST with OOL and SP with OON to match to pictures. And then I watched them write the words and then I watched them take dictation on the words and then I listened to them um, listening to a story with those words and they were just rotating. I could feel gray hair sprouting left, right, and sideways and thinking I could probably make a quick secret call, rent a U-Haul truck, and rescue all these poor babies. But <laughs> in any event, at one point, I was standing at the table where the children were doing their work page. And one of the boys looked up at me and he said, how come you're here? And I said, nice to meet you as well. Um, <laughs> And I said, well, I come to all different kindergartens to see how children learn in kindergarten. Oh, he said, okay. And I said to the children, this looks like very big girl and big boy work that you're doing. It looks like first grade work. And the kids nodded, yes, it was big boy and big girl work. And I said, well, do you like doing all of this? Um, and the first fellow looked at me and he said, well, we used to play more. I liked that. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So 90-minute literacy groups, and now you can uh, buy products that will allow you to um, introduce uh, funtervals, exercise moments, into classrooms where recess doesn't exist any, anymore. So what we're seeing is pre-literacy development isn't pre anymore. It's been pushed down because if you have to read in kindergarten then you have to learn those skills earlier than that. I cannot say it enough times. Oral language is the foundation of literacy. I have written about this because I absolutely know it to be true. And do you see that mathematical equation underneath oral language is the foundation of literacy? We use the word reading when we mean decoding. Decoding is saying the sounds that are represented by the squiggles we call letters or graphemes that represent the sounds of the language that we are decoding. Unless you understand what those words mean, you are not reading. You are only decoding. And that's important to keep in mind. Reading is a much, much more complex cognitive task that is based on oral language skills. Now, many years ago, I worked with a woman who, a psychologist from Poland, who had worked with Jean Piaget. So by extension, because I knew her, I got exposure to Piaget. And so this was a story that Eleonora Jedrasek used to tell, and it goes like this. Did you hear the one about the pigeon? It goes this way. If you give me enough bird seed and enough time 
I can teach a pigeon the alphabet. And that is true. Learning the alphabet is not the same as learning to read. Because reading means you understood what you decoded. So pre-literacy skills are crucial. Crucial. We are looking for pre, which is called phonological awareness. Phono, as in sound, phonograph. You remember those things. All right. So we're looking at an awareness of print, and I will talk with you about that, knowledge of the alphabet, and phonological awareness, being able to play with the sounds of the language, manipulate them by rhyming, by using alliteration. Look at lovely Lydia, languishing in the lights. All right. Look. Listen, love, like, lollipop, finding all the words that you can that start with L. Do you know how to clap the syllables? Pizza, strawberry. You don't have to know the meaning of the word. You don't have to decode the word. You have to play with the word. Now here is some developmental information for you. I can go into a three-year-old class and spot the kids who are at risk for having difficulty learning to decode. You know why? Because they can't learn the rhymes. They can't learn the rhymes. They can do the motions. Okay. But they can't produce the rhyme it is an early sign. Why? Because it's a phonological awareness skill. It is sound-based. And when you see them in the threes, unless you work specifically with them on developing those skills, people have a tendency not to notice. Because you can have perfectly clear speech and lovely, fancy, great sentences but not be able to rhyme. And I'll tell you what, if you can't rhyme and you can't recognize alliteration between the age of three and four, you're gonna have some trouble in schools these days. These are the skills that precede learning to decode, say the words on the page. It makes a very big difference to have these skills. And part of what you must remember is that the rate of oral language growth is huge. It happens so fast, I can't tell you. I'll come another day and talk to you about vocabulary growth. But two to three year olds have two to 300 words in typical development in the middle class. Three to four year olds have between 500 and 1,000 words. And by the time kids get to kindergarten, by the time they get to kindergarten, five or six, Heading towards first grade, 6,000 words. So we went from two to three, at two to 300 words, to six, 6,000 words. The growth is enormous. Knowing the words and knowing about the way the words are created and formed are developmental skills. And unless you recognize rhyme, unless you can clap out the syllables, unless you can count the sounds and words, you're going to have a devil of a time learning to decode. That's part of why we do nursery rhymes. That's part of why we play with the, with the children and with the sounds of the language. And if you're not already doing this in your classrooms, here are some literacy activities that you can do. Listening games. I don't care if you put marbles in, in one can and cotton balls in the other. Put chocolate chips in one can and M&Ms in the other. Start teaching them to listen to the difference among the sounds. That becomes not only a listening skill, you know why? Because the difference between P and B is not very great. But it also, so as a discrimination, a discrimination task, it's crucial, but from a language and intellectual development, same and different. You can always attach it to language. That's Sam I am, that's Sam I am. I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam. Yeah. 
Sam, that guy is not what you want to hear. <laughs> All right. What I want you to do is read aloud a lot. Beware of teacher's neck. I mean, we have chiropractors in our family, so I can leave business cards, but beware of, beware of teacher's neck. If you're right-handed, you hold it in your left hand. If you're left-handed, you hold it in your right hand. So the crick moves from side to side. <laughs> but what I do, and I have been yelled at by three-year-olds, I don't turn the book around and show them. I want to see the pictures. I want a lot of things, kid. I don't, <laughs> I don't show, I said, you know what I want you to do? I'm going to show you the pictures. I'm going to show you the pictures. I promise. I know. I will. I'm a good teacher. But I want you to listen to my words. Listen to my words and think. Let's see if the picture in your mind looks like the picture on the page. And then I turn it around. I don't do that every time for every kid, but I'm trying to give them visualization skills, attaching images to the words and to develop thinking skills. I want them to look at these things called literacy devices. The font changes, italics. I want them to look at those bubbles over the character's head that says he's about to say something. I want them to see quotation marks. All of that becomes a big deal down the pike. We can do that with books without making the kids read the words. We can prepare them for the literacy tasks that are coming by building their language awareness and literacy awareness by reading to them. I love the morning message. We can do lots of alliteration in the morning message. We can do punctuation. We can do grammatical rephrasing. We can do synonyms in the morning message. We can predict what I'm going to write, and I can make a mistake, and you can edit it. We can do all sorts of things that are literacy preparation without teaching them to decode. We can create word walls for them that have a sorting task about all the words we learned that rhyme, all the words we learned that have this many syllables without having to decode them. We can do sorting activities about words that tell us who, words that tell us where, words that tell us how. We can do funny words, long words, words for big animals, words for small animals. You are building their language and literacy preparation skills. So, so, so crucial and foundational before we teach them that parlor trick of learning to decode unless you have a pigeon and a lot of bird seed. All righty. And then there's language and social, emotional development. Language in play, language in intellectual development, language in literacy, language and social emotional development. When people ask, I go to lots of um, preschool, Committee on Preschool Education and CSE meetings, I go to meetings with parents all the time and, you, and they, you ask, what do you want for your child? And people always say the exact same thing. I want them to be happy. I want him to be happy. So this morning, Mrs. Reitzis acknowledged South Korea when she greeted people around the world this morning. And that was as a courtesy to me, because one of my sons is teaching in South Korea. Ergo, I am enormously indebted to the people who develop Skype. Because without Skype, I would be a wreck. It's very far away. There's an enormous time difference. Do I want my child to be so very far away from me? Nope. But you know what he said to me last Sunday? This is the other good thing. How many of you have a 23-year-old who sits and talks to you for three hours every Sunday morning? I do. All right. <laughs> On Skype. And you know how he ended the conversation? I love you guys. And I just want you to know I'm really happy. That's what we want for our children. So what does that have to do with language? Well, because language plays an important role in the development of emotional regulation, all right? It's important to basic emotional development. Why? Because language is a means of representing your emotional experiences. 
And if you don't have the language to label your feeling or your experience, if you don't have the language to elaborate or to integrate those feelings across different contexts, if you don't have the language to use to compare your feelings in this situation to your feelings in another situation, to somebody else's experiences. You heard Dr. McNamee talk about that this morning. All you have to do is think of that troll on the bridge, the, the, the billy goat scruff, all right? All of this contributes to greater understanding of emotion and ultimately to emotional regulation, all righty? Language also makes it possible for us to participate in adult child conversations that help emotional regulation. Adults get to help kids give labels to and implement strategies for how to deal with emotion. Our ability to use language to, um, to communicate to others enables us to be socially appropriate. I remember whenever I talk about Vygotsky, and, and how language is important to social emotional development and regulation, I think of watching the two-year-olds who do not yet have an enormous amount of language, who look at something that they want, regardless of the fact that it's in somebody else's hot little hand, and start going, <laughs> mine, all right? As opposed to, don't grab, don't grab, don't grab, don't grab. Don't grab, don't grab, and then grabbing. But at least they are in the process of talking to themselves in their heads or in a tiny little voice. Language enhances a person's ability to understand their own emotional life and the emotional lives of others. And socialization with adults and other children, the language that they learn influences the quality of their emotional development and emotional regulation. So as we as adults, as parents and in teacher, as teachers, use language to describe our own emotional experiences and theirs, we give them more words and, and concepts to represent their feelings and a new tool for them to be able to control their behavior. So we know that it is usually important to have the language of emotion, and I'm going to give you an example of, um, of this in a minute. But what I want you to think about is teachers can use the language of problem solving and the language of negotiation in these situations that will help kids label the experiences they're having. What does that mean? The influence of your language is this. Asking a child what can be done about a particular problem, even if that problem is a bad feeling, instead of only soothing or fixing the problem. Use the words you have. So last week I was at a school and watched a seven-year-old responding to the teacher's instructions by saying, and I quote, Wah! She was seven. No matter what the teacher said, the kid said, and I'm mentoring the teacher, and I'm thinking, I'm again, thinking about Dr. DG. I wish this kid wouldn't come back to school tomorrow because this teacher is having a hard time. And then this young teacher looked at this youngster, and she said, you're really frustrated. This is hard for you. I think that's why you're saying, wow, when I ask you to do something. And guess what stopped? stopped. She gave a name, a word that the youngster didn't have to the feeling that she was experienced. Now, remember that line that I offered you early on? Sticks and stones may break my bones. These are, sadly, real and true examples of what I have heard teachers to say, and I know that none of you, not one of you, will ever say anything like this. Uh, hello, uh, so do you think maybe you want to pay attention? <laughs> the, I, this is my right hand to the powers that be. These are quotes, language and social emotional regulation. How about this one? What are you doing? She didn't like the way he was glowing. He was four. 
So this is why you need to learn to follow directions, because there was a mess. I am so sad that nobody in this class knows the answer. <laughs> You know it's all about me. <laughs> I'm sad because you're making poor choices. <laughs> I swear to you, I didn't make this up. You need to have some self-control. Anybody who doesn't have self-control will get a strike. One, two, three, you're out. She looked a lot like Yogi Berra. And then there was this one. Oh, this is no good. Fix this. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Yes, but words, language can be, if you're not careful, harmful. Now I bring you back up. This next is a lovely cartoon, and it talks about personality and affective development, and it talks about parental needs or adult realities versus children's realities. The power of language. Honey, when you grow up, I want you to be assertive, independent, and strong-willed. But while you're a kid, I want you to be passive, pliable, and obedient. <laughs> oh, the power of language. And then, because obviously I could talk for a very long time about language, but I wanted to give you bits and pieces. Language is everywhere. It's part of what makes us human. It's in everything we do. Talk is cheap, but my gosh, is it enormously valuable. There's great power. Choose your words very, very wisely. And keep in mind that talking is not teaching. When I was little, they wanted me to be a teacher. I wanted to be a doctor. I became a teacher doctor. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. Um, and I love being a teacher, and I love working with teachers because we entrust our children to you. And that's why I, I'm very honest in telling you, I wanted to end with this. This has been an extraordinary day. Tomorrow will be exciting. But it's also a very tumultuous time in American education. And I think that our children are more vulnerable than we realize to the forces out there. And so when I saw this, here is my final thought. And I am telling you the truth, I saw this on a t-shirt. And if I hadn't already bought this suit for today, I might have worn the t-shirt. <laughs> Those who can, teach. And those who can't, Thank you very much. I told Fred I was going to get a standing ovation. Can I answer any questions for you, ladies and gentlemen? Or do you have to go pick up the kids and get home before the... It's hard to be the caboose. You're welcome. Have a good evening.